welcome to today's media call. Um, my name is Christoph von Schierstedt, I'm with Media Relations Atlantic. And today Atlantic will present you details on the new VDSL chips family. So with me today here in the room from our top management is Dirk Wiebernight. He's the general manager of our CPE business unit. And also Frank Engel, uh, he's Atlantic marketing manager for VDSL. So um, before we give the presentation on our chipset, we will have Lee Ratliff, he's principal analyst from IHS iSupply, and he will give us an overview on the VDSL market, and um, this um, will be done, as I said, from Dallas at 2 o'clock in the morning. So uh, a big thank you for Lee already. Um, and this overview he's giving us today comes from his latest report available now, and it's called Finally the Stars Have Aligned for VDSL. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Lee. So Christoph asked me to uh, attend a call this morning and give a brief overview of what's been going on in the marketplace with VDSL. And so uh, just uh, over the past year or so, it's become increasingly clear that there is a sizable opportunity shaping up for VDSL. And it's, it's really due to a couple of factors. Um, one is economics and one is performance. Um, uh, as far as economics is concerned, um, since the, the financial meltdown in, 2000, uh, in the 2009 timeframe, uh, telcos uh, her time horizon for the return on investment has, has really shortened. Um, there's a lot of projects that were begun before the meltdown were, were, were that, that really weren't going to pay off for maybe up to 10, 10 years or so. Uh, but that's just really not happening today. Um, telco time horizons are, are very, very short, uh, three years, maybe even two years. And so they're, they're really starting projects that, that just have a more immediate payoff. Um, it, and the, the biggest effect here is with FTTH, uh, fiber to the home. I think everybody in the industry kind of views this as, as inevitable, that it's going to happen. Uh, and a lot of telcos definitely are, are looking at this as, as something they're going to do. However, it's still very costly to deploy. Uh, it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, including the, the density of the deployment and, the, and how the size of the deployment and what kind of economies of scale you can get. Uh, but, it, but any way you look at it, it's, it's very costly to, to deploy fiber to, every, to you know, all the way to the home. And frankly, it's, it's really overkill for, for the kind of demand that uh, exists for broadband today. Um, the, the, other, the other half of this equation kind of is, is performance. And, uh, of course, VDSL is nothing new. VDSL has been around for a number of years. Uh, VDSL 2 has been deployed, you know, quite, quite a few years now. However, it's really just recently where um, uh, vectoring and bonding technologies have become uh, reality. And it's enabling us to push that VDSL performance up uh, uh, well past what, what VDSL is capable of today. Um, just to pick on them as an example, uh, one that I'm familiar with is the AT&T U-verse deployment here in North America. And uh, in the past, that's been essentially a 25 megabit per second deployment, half for, for internet surfing normal general purpose broadband and the other half is for streaming several high definition uh, tel television signals. Um, uh, VDSL with, with vectoring and bonding has the potential of, of doubling, tripling, or even quadrupling that kind of performance. And that has a real, real big payoff for operators like AT&T that it allows them to stream better quality video, more quality, quality of video, and hands the consumer just a ton more, double or triple uh, the available bandwidth for, for, for internet surfing and other applications. So these two factors together make VDSL a great value play and a very timely one. Um, 
VDSL deployment cost is a fraction of, of what it costs to deploy fiber to the home. And it is true that performance does not match the potential of coax and fiber. Both of those just due to physics or, or have, a, have a lot more potential. Um, but it definitely exceeds subscriber demand today and, and many years out into the future. If you look at what subscribers are actually consuming in terms of uh, broadband uh, packages, it's typically very, very, very small amount uh, compared to what's available from uh, service providers. So service providers, be they uh, carriers or uh, um, cable providers, are often providing, you know, uh, 25, 50, uh, 100 megabits or more of uh, broadband bandwidth, but the consumers are typically using um, the, the, the tier they're subscribed to is quite often, you know, a 10, 15, 20 megabit per second tier. And so demand really has not caught up with the, the capabilities. And so I think that's a, a positive uh, for VDSL um, in the short and midterm. Yeah. So VDSL is really a, a stepping stone to an all fiber network. It allows the carrier to make a relatively small investment to satisfy uh, subscriber demand for a period of, say, five years, perhaps more, uh, while they delay an investment in, in a fiber network, hopefully, you know, waiting for a point where they can get a better uh, return on their investment for fiber. Or perhaps it's something that they deploy very quickly while at the same time they're also deploying a fiber to the home network that may take uh, a number of years to deploy. So I, I have some, some data here on the next slide with about VDSL subscriber growth. Uh, right now, uh, ADSL far dominates not only, not only a, a, a VDSL with cable and fiber to home and everything else, ADSL is by far the most popular. We see that definitely flattening. Um, it, in the 2016, 2017 timeframe, that is really becoming uh, pretty much zero growth. However, at the same time, uh, within, uh, within the DSL segment, VDSL is growing quite rapidly. It's growing at about a 30% CAGR right now, whereas uh, overall broadband would be about a 10, or 10 to 11% uh, uh, compound annual growth rate. When you look at that as a percentage of, uh, of total DSL, uh, VDSL today is, is somewhere in the uh, um, uh, eight or nine percent range, but but that will be ramping up to about twenty percent uh, by by the twenty seventeen timeframe. Um, that's really driven by growth in it, it, it's global growth, but it's primarily driven by Europe and North America, which accounts for the vast majority of subs uh, today and, and through twenty seventeen. On the next slide, I can show uh, what that's doing to the customer premises equipment forecast. So this is a very different looking slide. Uh, on this, you can see that ADSL has already peaked. In fact, um, the peak actually occurred before 2009. Um, what you're seeing in 2009 and 2010 is a recovery after the financial uh, meltdown. Uh, but it's already, it's already peaked and has been declining um, while VDSL is actually uh, growing quite rapidly. Uh, today, VDSL accounts for somewhere uh, just oh, just less than, uh, let's see, what's that, about 25% uh, 20, or something like that in, in terms of overall CPE, but that's growing to uh, 56% by 2017. So this is due to a couple of reasons. One, the biggest one is the, the derivative effect. So the, CPE demand is kind of a derivative of the installed base. So the installed base um, can grow um, relatively slowly compared to the from year to year compared to the overall size of the installed base, but has but can have a much more profound effect on the on the rate of the CPE growth. Uh, the other the other things are that ADSL customers are often given a VDSL mode with ADSL fallback. Um, just because the provider intends to eventually go to VDSL, and when they do, they don't want to roll a truck and, and, and uh, uh, suffer that much larger.
larger expense. Finally, video cell CPE is replaced much more often. It's a more cutting edge technology, it's much newer. There's, some, there's technological reasons, for instance, uh, you know, um, if, you, if you deployed a video cell modem several years ago and today you want to do a bonding or perhaps a, a vectoring and you don't have a, a compatible uh, chipset, you might be replacing your video cell CPE just to enable that, techno that technology. Uh, at the same time, ADSL is, is the life cycle is actually extending quite a bit. And one of the reasons there is well, it's just an older, older technology and much more mature, but I'm also in some of these deployments that are uh, actually shrinking, there's a phenomenon that modems and gateways are being refurbished and redeployed and not uh, creating up creating a demand for new for new equipment. So uh, anyway, that's all I've that's all I've got on this. Um, so Christoph. And now I'm handing over to Dirk Wieberneit. He's general manager of our customer premises equipment business unit and to Frank Engel, senior marketing manager for VDSL. And they will update us on what drove Lantic to bring such a thrilling new VDSL chipset to the market. So I'm handing over to Dirk. Yeah, good morning everybody on the line. Um, so I'm happy to uh, give you some insights into our new product family. So to start, I would like to uh, walk you through the uh, different scenarios uh, we see basically for the VDSL deployment uh, and what we are going to achieve with, with our new product family, VRX300. So here on this page, you see basically the, the main deployment scenarios. So in the, in the upper case, let's say the typical um, uh, way that the, the, the home is already connected via COPPA to the, to the central office, or a scenario which will stay alive uh, for the next couple of years, especially in the rural areas. So here, basically, um, a data uh, rate of between 1 to 20 megabit typically is, is delivered to the home. In many cases, still, even uh, if there is a VDSL CPE at the home, still um, the line is, is operated in an ADSL fallback mode. So that the typical data rates are in, in that range. So and then coming more to the uh, urban or suburban areas, also where basically there's a strong competition from the, uh, from the telcos uh, against cable. We see an ongoing update of, of the network uh, with fiber. But as said, uh, fiber to the home because of the huge investment uh, still in, in, on a low rate. But at least what we see then that fiber is distributed to the uh, street cabinet uh, with fiber to the curb of fiber to the nodes, uh, that's the middle scenario. And then the last mile, couple of hundred meters, is basically bridged with VDSL to the home. In that scenario today, we can see typically between 20 to 50 megabit that can be achieved. One more stop ahead, which at least now is also in discussions with many carriers as, as, as a further step is bringing fiber closer to the home. Still not to the home, but uh, one, one case is fiber to the distribution point um, where you typically then have to bridge the last less than 100 meters um, or even fiber to the building where you just basically use copper inside the, the house then to distribute. Uh, so in these scenarios you typically can achieve 50 to 100 megabit uh, via today's VDSL technology. So what is now happening with introducing our new product family? We introduce uh, the full range of bonding capability and together with vectoring. So that enables us in these uh, partly fiber scenarios to upgrade uh, the, the data bandwidth up to 200 megabit in a case of combining bonding and vectoring uh, or up to 150 megabit just deploying vectoring. So we see that as a major step up. Um, handing over this te te technology, uh, which will basically deliver uh, a huge value add um, and will enable uh, telcos in a, in, a, in a very sufficient way to compete against uh, cable on the one side, but also to enable uh, new service models, uh, as almost every telco is, is aiming for, delivering high, uh, 
content uh, video services to the home. So with our new VRX300, we enable this pass. With that, I would uh, hand over to Frank now to uh, give you some more details, both on the numbers, on real life numbers, um, which we have measured in the lab. Yeah, <clears throat> hello everybody. So Frank Engel here. Yeah, let's uh, talk about the product. So more more details uh, on that. So what we are addressing with the VRX 300 family, we just uh, heard about bonding and vectoring. Uh, this is exactly what we also support here with the VRX 300. Um, in let's say in the past, uh, bonding was more used to to get the reach. To the subscriber, what we see now a trend is more getting also the bit rate to the uh, to the customer to the subscriber. So shortening, of course, with uh, fiber to the curb scenarios where you can reach up to 200 megabit for second uh, per second. Um, on the bit rate side, we see the vectoring uh, is uh, standardized now. There are different solutions out there. There are trials are going on right now, and we are expecting also that end of the year we see here the first uh, deployments. Also, in all the cases of the, let's say, diesel technology, you have a dependency on the loop length to the bit rate. And when you go to fiber to the building uh, scenarios, as we just showed, you can go up to 150 megabit per second. On the flexibility side, so the VRX 300 family uh, vectoring is basically on the CPE side of firmware software uh, topic. So you need, uh, we provide it either with a chip uh, right away, or you can uh, upgrade uh, later on your CPE uh, to vectoring. Uh, on the bonding side, so we support all profiles from profile 8, 12, 17, and 30 on bonding, where we see the main deployments right now on profile uh, 17 uh, uh, right now. Uh, coming to the next slide, what you see here is a uh, VDSL gateway based on the VRX 300 system. This contains of the, the, the communication processor, GRX 300 which is a highly integrated uh, processor featuring integrated wireless LAN 2x2 two two or 3x3. Three three. So there is a wireless LAN Mac integrated into that device. So within the thick Mac uh, architecture, this means a dedicated uh, um, CPU driving the wireless LAN, which is, let's say, offloading the main CPU for its uh, other tasks like uh, uh, routing, like um, uh, streaming, like uh, voice, handling, for example. We also featuring an, an voice DSP in there with integrated codecs. We are, uh, have integrated a gigabit ethernet switch, six port switch, also integrated gigabit ethernet files into that device, of course, uh, supporting a USB and DEC. And uh, you attach it with the um, VDSL transceiver um, part. This is the VRX318, which is doing, of course, VDSL2, but it's also backwards compatible to ADSL2, ADSL2 Plus on all the ADSL2 schemes. So you can uh, drive this also in ADSL mode. Coming to the next slide, this is uh, showing you actually in fiber to the curb scenario in typical case. You have where well, you have a cabinet, a street cabinet connected with active Ethernet, for example, uh, to to the central office and uh, on the subscriber line. You have a uh, copper. In this uh, example, we have a, we took a 48 uh, pair cable and in a typical case of fun, uh, 500 meter to the subscriber. What you see with with the red uh, bars is actually what you can achieve when you have no vectoring uh, enabled. So when you have the full crosstalk uh, on the line, so you can get average 50, let's say, to 60 megabit uh, per channel. So when you reduce the crosstalk with vectoring, you can go up to 100 megabit, so which is coming close to a single uh, line uh, channel scenario. So this is what you can achieve in the fiber to the curb scenario. And also when you go closer, of course, with a multi dwelling unit like fiber to the building, where you have distances of less than 100 meter, you go up to 150 megabit with vectoring. Um, yeah, there is a carrier gain, of course, with the vectoring. There are a lot of discussions in the media right now uh, where you can double uh, almost your data rate from typical 50 to 100 megabit per single link in fiber to the curb, fiber to the node scenarios. 
and upstream you go up to 50, uh, 40 megabit per second. So we learned from, from Lee at the beginning there is a huge saving in CapEx for the carrier when you uh, compare this to a pure FTTH deployment and uh, going up to 100 or 150 megabit is really a huge amount where you can reuse your existing copper infrastructure, you can reuse your CPEs you have at home. Of course, on the VSAM side, you have to do some uh, amendments, but on the CPE side, uh, it's just an, an upgrade. Coming to the next one, to the bonding topic, it's basically the same scenario, the same system architecture. It's you add an additional VRX318 to it, then you address uh, the bonding scenarios where, as I mentioned, you can do profile 8, 12, 17, and 30. So it's in a very, let's say, simple approach connected to the main processor family. Uh, the next um, diagram shows you what you can typically achieve here based on the VRX318. Also here, of course, you see a dependency on the loop length on copper, but it goes up to 200 megabit when your cabinet is getting closer, so where you have dense areas in Europe, for example, the cabinets are usually pretty close, and you can go up to 200 megabit per second. Coming to the next slide, also, of course, here you have a an, an, an huge gain for the operator, for the encumbrance. Um, when you see today the cable operators, their offerings on 200 megabit. So this technology enables the, the main operator to compete against cable offerings. So downstream 200 megabit, upstream 100 megabit is possible. Also here we see a reduced capex, uh, of course, um, on that side. So let's say 70 of 80 percent we see on the copper lines the people have two pairs at home already. So this is an, a, a nice technology really to, to boost up the reader cell at the end and go up to 200 megabit per second. So coming to a short uh, summary, uh, as I just said, so 200 megabit per, per second with bonding is possible. Uh, with our VRX 300 system, so and up to 150 megabit on a single line is also possible. So when you look at the fiber to the distribution point or fiber to the building scenarios, or even fiber to the curb where you have your cabinet very uh, close to the end customer, uh, we are fully standard compliant. So we fully support all ITU standards on bonding and vectoring. This is an also an important topic when it comes also to interoperability, for example, and. We support uh, all profiles, as I mentioned before. So with a single gateway design, this means no change of your hardware or the CPE um, when you have different deployment scenarios or carrier. Partly you have a mixed uh, scenario with, with profile 17 on 30. So there is no need uh, to change here the hardware. Um, our VRX 300 family is part of the Atlantic Anyone technology. Anyone was already announced back to the Broadband World Forum in 2012. This means we have one communication processor, uh, as you just uh, saw with the GRX 300. So this means one, you have one gateway architecture on the software side, on the hardware side, and you can add flexible and smart one interfaces, how we call it. So with the VDSL2, we just showed with the VRX318, or if you want to address ADSL separately, or if you want to address a pure router uh, Ethernet gateway, or if you want to address GPON or LTE, it's just done by adding different one modules. So also here the embedded wireless LAN 11N subsystem we have here in, in our uh, VRX 300 system with the offloading architecture. This uh, provides you the highest uh, quality of service on one side so far and gives you the CPU uh, free performance for all the demanding apps you have today on video, for example. And what we also support here with the, our Wi-Fi 11N subsystem is so-called beamforming. Beamforming basically is uh, you extend your reach of your wireless LAN connection. And this is a very important issue as we see for carriers as the service calls are more and more to wireless LAN related as you do not get your signal in your whole house or in your whole apartment on one side. So this is basically I wanted to share with you on the summary. Um, 
on the, the availability we have it uh, right now, so we are sampling right now. So volume production is uh, planned during June 2013. Thank you, Frank. So um, what we have just seen is uh, how the VRIC 300 delivers a significant performance up in uh, responding and vectoring in, in the typical deployment scenarios of today's fiber to a, to a distribution point and then bridging, uh, bridging the last mile to the home. So the remaining question is, of course, now what is happening, let's say, in the traditional scenarios, as you see in, in, the, in, the, in the above um, case. So we have copper between the home and the central office, and this is still a big part of the network, uh, the suburban as well in the rural areas, which will be there for, for another couple of years. So also here, we basically work on a technology to, uh, uh, to bring significant improvement uh, also in this case. Um, so we call it DSL LTE. Uh, it's a hybrid technology. Uh, we already achieve in, in actually in our lab up to two, 280 megabits per second based on bonded VDSL plus LTE. So our open AnyWAN architecture enables uh, to combine a DSL WAN together with an LTE module and then deliver this kind of hybrid uh, data rate combination. So as I said, it's right now in our lab. We are planning to uh, release this technology uh, very soon. Uh, we will have a press, press release on, on, on that step in Computex in a couple of weeks. So then we will give you more details on this technology, but you see basically we are addressing all the uh, deployment scenarios of VDSL with our VX300 family giving a significant value add um, for the next generation.